Good morning, everybody. So I'm Ward Appeltons, and I work for IUC UNESCO. The IUC is the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and there I am the focal point for marine biodiversity. So there, so I also manage the OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, and I support the Goose Biology and Ecosystems Panel. So today I will give you an introduction to OBIS and what that can mean for the BBNJ. Start with some statistics. At the moment we have 46 million species observations from 4.6 million sampling events, from 3.2 million sampling stations, from 170,000 marine species. We integrate 1,900 databases in one central global database. We have about 500 data providers from 56 countries. There's about 1,000 papers, scientific papers, that have cited OBIS so far, some of them very high impact papers, and we are adding about 10 new papers every month. It all started as part of the Census of Marine Life in 2000, where OBIS was the data repository and information dissemination system. If you remember the times of the Census of Marine Life, you, you got these lovely media uh, coverages of new species discoveries. So the purpose of the Census of Marine Life was really to document what lives uh, and will live in the ocean. So that was a huge international program funded by the Sloan Foundation. And it was made very clear from the beginning that OBIS should become the data legacy and uh, but will not be funded anymore after those 10 years of Sloan funding. So it had to find a new home. And so OBIS in 2009 was adopted by the IUC Assembly as part of IUDE, the International Oceanographic Data Information Exchange Program. So uh, why IUC? Well, IUC is the UN focal point for ocean science, ocean observations and services, data information exchange and capacity building. It was established in 1960 and has now 148 member states. And if you look at the vision of IUC, it really focuses on scientific understanding and systematic observations of the ocean to underpin sustainable development and global governance. So it fits nicely within the mandate of IUC. Um, well, why would they be interested in OBIS? Well, they agreed that the knowledge of oceans biodiversity is of such importance to national and global environmental issues that the responsibility of the success of OBIS should be assumed by governments. OBIS, as I said, is part of IUDE. IUDE, the International Oceanographic Data Information Exchange Program, is one of the, is the oldest program of IOC, established in 1961. Its vision is to have a comprehensive and integrated ocean data information system, serving the broad and diverse needs of all IOC member states for both routine and scientific use. It promotes the discovery and exchange of marine data, promotes long-term archiving, best practices and standards, capacity building, and supports international marine scientific research programs. There's a huge list of pro projects going on under OBIS, of which OBIS is one uh, under IUD. And then on this map, you can see the more than 100 IUD data centers, some of them national oceanographic data centers, which form part of the network of IUD. The office of the IUD is in Flanders, Belgium since 2005, and there is also, that's also the basis of the OBIS Secretariat. The overall goals of OBIS is now we, that we have a mandate under the United Nations, is to contribute to the protection of the marine ecosystems by assisting in identifying marine biodiversity hotspots and large-scale ecological patterns. One of our object objectives is setting the baseline for marine biodiversity assessment and monitoring it's important to note that OBIS is not only a database, it's really a global alliance, a global network of marine researchers, data managers that collaborate to facilitate free and open access and the application of data, of biodiversity data on information. This map shows you the almost 500 data providing institutions all over the world which are connected through OBIS nodes. OBIS nodes can be national, regional, or thematic. We have at the moment 21 OBIS nodes, 
which are responsible for the collection of the data, for data processing, the quality control, and making sure that the international OBIS can harvest them and integrate them. OBIS governance structure is the work plan is developed by the steering group of OBIS, the ID steering group of OBIS, which is composed of the managers of the OBIS nodes and we form a number of task teams to execute the tasks and the work plan. That work plan is then presented to the IUD committee for IUDE, which, uh, which uh, meets every two years. And the recommendations are then put forward to the IUC assembly, which makes the resolutions and adopts the recommendations of IUDE. That work plan and budgets uh, are then forwarded to the UNESCO General Conference, who decides on the budget of IOC. As I said, we meet annually. Here is a number of the pictures of our group pictures of our steam group meetings. So how in practice, how does this work? We have our data providers at the bottom. Those are harvested by the OBIS nodes who are responsible for QAQC. Then the international OBIS and the harvest the OBIS nodes on every three months. We integrate, we also QC the data, and we index them, and then make them available through a web portal and create some uh, statistics. So the international OBIS secretariat, here hosted in Ostend in Belgium, uh, provides training and technical assistance, guides new standards and technical developments, and encourages international cooperation. Meaning that if a partner in our network is developing something new or proposing a new standard and that is shared amongst the network members. When IUC adopted OBIS, it really didn't uh, uh, level off in terms of number of records and number of data sets that were contributed to OBIS. It really start, continued increasing. This is still an old slide, but now at the moment we have, as I, as I said, six, uh, 46 million records. We have, since the 1990s, about 1.2 million records annually, of which 1 million are within the EEZs and 200,000 are in A, B, and J. In total, we have about 7.5 7 million records in A, B, and J, of about nearly 80,000 species, of which 14,500 are exclusively uh, occurring in A, B, and J. As you can see, the majority of our records are about 50% are from fish records, but we have uh, we cover all ta major taxonomic groups. In terms of sampling effort, this is a, a graph that shows the volume of the ocean and the number of records according to that uh, volume. There you can see that actually the 99% of the ocean volume is still severely undersampled. So for 10,000 cube kilometers, we have less than 100 sampling days, less than 700 records, and less than 13 species in our database. Although it is improving, uh, this graph shows you the number of records per latitude and per year. It really shows that global monitoring started since the 1950s and progressively increased in the southern hemisphere. In the Arctic, it apparently it went up and down, according through through the decades. We are also sampling further away from the coastline. This graph shows you the distance from nearest land, and, and throughout the years. Also, we're sampling deeper and deeper into the ocean. Although it seems to be hard to go further. And, uh, more than 5,000 meters deep. There's still lots of opportunities. It's really uh, not slowing down to have uh, interest in data and information. Uh, if we need, there's a growing demand of data information for robust ocean health and risk assessments. 
there are a number of agencies and, and assessments and, and uh, initiatives like the World Ocean Assessment of the United Nations, the Climate Change Convention, the CBD, the Conventional Biological Diversity Convention. They all recognize the critical requirement for enhanced and sustainable observations of the global ocean. But it's really critical that we improve the way in which, we ob which observ observation data is managed and made available. That's where OBUS can have a role in. So talking about the data clearinghouse and sharing facility, what is, does that really mean? It is, there's a huge amount of data collected and made available on spreadsheets, but they are not readily available or usable for the community. So that data curation service is really making data and products available that are readily uh, and efficiently usable. So integrating that information, quality controlling and different information and indexing and make these available through databases and uh, through web services so that can, they can be easily accessed anywhere in the world is what uh, the data clearinghouse and sharing facility is about. So to give you an example of OBIS, here is a paper that was published uh, a few months ago in Nature, I think it was Nature Climate Change, um, on the thermal bias of uh, the world's marine fauna using data from a reef life survey. It, this, this really shows the vulnerability of fish species to global warming. We decided to try to do the same exercise for coral reefs in Obis. So we developed together with the R Open Science community an R package on Obis, which allows you to access uh, through the R, which is an open source data analysis statistical package. You can easily download 400,000 exacoral records you have the sea surface temperature data from NOAA, which can be accessed through the R SPAMF package. If you combine the OBIS data and the, and the sea surface temperature records, you can create species envelopes according to temperature, and you can clearly see two uh, spikes. One, of, one represents the, the, the cold water corals and one the warm water coral species. If you then look at the IPCC scenarios, uh, which represents the prediction of sea surface temperature in the future. And you can you can bind these models. You can actually uh, calculate uh, the 95% interval of uh, where coral species uh, can still uh, occur and survive. But if that, if we assume that if they cross the border of their 95% interval, it will become very difficult for those species to survive, especially if that higher temperature continues throughout a long period. So this graph shows you uh, the current status and the, pro uh, the projected status. In the current status, there's less species, uh, specimens that occur in that red zone. But if you look at the project projected area, there's more and more species that are moving into that red zone. So if you put this on a global map, you can actually make a prediction of this, uh, the coral species that will be will lose by 2059, according to the IPCC scenarios. And interestingly is that it's mostly in the temperate areas where more than 75% of the coral species will probably be gone extinct uh, if this scenario is true, of course. This is just an example where uh, anybody in the world really who knows a bit about st st statistical analysis uh, can easily make a very nice nature paper if, uh, if you're lucky. One thing that we become more and more aware of is that um, as OBIS has always been focusing on the, the occurrences of species, we were losing quite a lot of, inf of, of essential and, and, and interesting information because when scientists sample uh, species they not only record the species occurrences but they record a lot more information on the environment the the habitat that the species live in so we so this is more what it looks like in terms of uh, a satellite or acoustic data for marine mammals they it's not just a species was found in point X in time. 
it really is a, a migrating pattern of, of species. It really goes to into uh, depths and there's data collected on salinity, temperature. And the problem was that those uh, observing networks didn't really regard Opus as a suitable data sharing platform for them because they could only share the species occurrences, not all the the uh, additional uh, uh, environmental data. So we re we recognized that problem. Well, sorry, this is an example of a of, of the network of uh, observing systems and acoustic and using acoustics and satellite data of uh, marine mammals. So it's a really large network that we would be missing if we if Obis would not be able to uh, accept that kind of data types. And that was recognized by the last uh, IUD committee for IUD session. So we set up a new pilot project to expand OBIS with environmental data. We have a network of 11 institutions a lot around the world that collaborate on, ex on finding out how OBIS could be dealing with this. And actually we found a solution uh, which I will show you here that in the past we focused on purely the occurrences but now the new OBIS standard uh, will have a, will be focusing on the sampling events and all the additional measurements, uh, abundance and biomass, but also salinity, temperature, uh, what all the chemical and physical uh, uh, measurements can be added in measurement effect extensions to OBIS. So it's a bit more complex structure that OBIS will be dealing with, but one that will be much more efficient for the and much more user uh, driven by the observing uh, networks. OBS supports several international processes. So we, we support development of indicators, support assessments, we support the identification of essential biological and ocean variables as part of GeoBond and GOOSE. And we support a number of international agencies like uh, the International Seabed Authority, FAO, UNEP, CBD, uh, etc. To give you an example of an assessment we are currently working on is the first global HAP status report. HAP stats stands for harmful algal blooms. And this will be based on the occurrences of, al of algae events in the HATA database, also hosted here at IUD, as well as species occurrences from OBIS. We support a number of processes in identifying uh, uh, critical areas like the EPSAs, the ecologically or biologically significant areas. I, su I suppose Joe uh, Apiot from CBD will talk about more about that later after my presentation. But OBIS is a key source of information for that process. And here, can sh here it's shown one of the uh, EPSAs based on data from OBIS. Supporting the International Seabed Authority is also one of our, of our aims and looking at the Clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone, in fact, we don't have a lot of data, unfortunately, from that area in Obis. And that's really an area we, we will need to focus on uh, to include more biodiversity data from the deep seabed. And in fact, we are setting up an Obis Deep Sea Node now in, in collaboration with NDEEP which is the International Network for Scientific Investigations of Deep Sea Ecosystems, as well as with the World Register of Deep Sea Species. We'll have a wor first uh, workshop and training course in October here at the OBIS office. We organize uh, one or two of these uh, training uh, courses every year, in which we train people in data cleaning, formatting, publications, how they can access visualize and do data analysis. So one of the training courses we had here in December in Belgium was very successful. People were very happy in, in that they can actually publish their data and make some uh, maps and, 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 now, and doing some analysis on their data. Those training courses are happening as part of the Ocean Teacher Global Academy, which is a project of IOD. And we, in that project, we are establishing a global network of regional training centers. At the moment, we have about 10 candidate training centers. Uh, so that means uh, all the training courses and the material are all shared on the same 
online training platform, the Ocean Teacher platform. And uh, trainings can happen in, in the local languages, local languages, and but also training material can be shared uh, with other training centers. We are also supporting the GOOS, the Global Ocean Observing System, which is, has now recently established a biology and ecosystems panel. Um, GOOS is really about setting a framework for ocean observations, trying to identify what is essential to measure and then hopefully that will support a sustained and integrated coordinated global ocean observing system. So how, we, how are we working in, with the GOOS bio and ecosystems uh, the biology and ecosystems panel. We are using the DIPSA framework, see what the drivers, the pressures, the state, the impact and the response is. Uh, so see what is the input, how are observing systems running at the moment and what are they actually delivering that provides a response to those uh, requirements. So then see, uh, so Checking the status of these observing systems is really looking at what are the impacts and what is the feasibility. So high impact, high feasibility is the target uh, investment that we need to focus on if we want to un have uh, a, a global wide uh, effective observing system that also deals with, bi with biodiversity. So some of the Observing networks will be in the concept phase, some will be pilot and some will be mature, which really means that they deliver the products and the data for societal benefit. We did a, recently a survey and from uh, 50 uh, observing systems to tell us what they are measuring and how they are measuring this. And at our recent meeting, we identified nine proposed biological EOVs, essential ocean variables, focus on functional groups, such as the status of phytoplankton, harmful algal blooms, zooplankton, fish, and uh, apex predator species. For ecosystems, the current proposed ones are coral reef health, seagrass, mangrove, and microalgal forest health. So at the moment, we are with the experts, we are developing the EOV specification sheets, which will provide information on uh, how those uh, variables should be uh, measured uh, or collected, how the data should be collected, how they should be processed, and what are, is the outcome, uh, what are the uh, expected outcomes. I will show you a number of slides of our new Obis Data Discovery Portal, which is still under development, but, but, which, which we uh, plan to release in a few weeks. And I decided to show you an example of the Costa Rica Dome, which is one of the important areas. It's, it's also one of the APSA areas. So it, allows, it will allow you to more easily discover what kind of data information is in OBIS. It will have interactive graphs like this one, for example. It shows you all the taxonomic groups and the, and the number of records of these taxonomic groups through time. Uh, you can, you can click on them. For example, you're only interested in the marine sponges, the porifera. If you click on that graph, you can show, it shows you from which data set this is. So this is um, three records of sponges in, uh, I can't remember in what year it was, somewhere in the 50s. It, it, it allows you to download a number of graphs, like the number of species per taxonomic groups, uh, the species, ac ac uh, 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 species accumulation curves, the sampling events. If you click, for example, on the species graph, you can see the list of all the fish species in the Costa Rica Dome, and you can download that as a CSV file. It shows you the number of records for species that are on the ICN red list, shows you the harmful algal species, that shows you the, the species that are only observed in that area, so potentially endemic species. It will show you the new species in that area, so first records, as an example here in 2014, 2012. It will also show you the species that are no longer observed in that area since the 50s and when they were last recorded for that area. 
so potentially uh, species that had disappeared from that area. It will give you an overview of all the data sets and the number of records in the taxa of that, from that area, and it will show you the number of data sets and records for each contributing institution. You will also be able to look at uh, species pages, information on species, for example, the herring. Um, you can see images, you can see the number of records and the percentage of uh, that species in particular areas, uh, the temperature, salinity, depth ranges, uh, occurrences through time, maps of the distribution of that species. If you look at the lost records, uh, but also the first records of that species. So there you can, and I'm showing this example uh, for a particular reason, is that you, you can see that that species is actually moving uh, polewards to, towards the North Pole, um, according to these to all these records, because in the in the Arctic areas those species were not been seen before the year 2000. So a number of take-home messages that I want to share with you. OBIS is, uh, provides a global data sharing platform and a data information clearinghouse mechanism for marine biodiversity in all ocean basins, including areas beyond national jurisdiction. It promotes international cooperation. It provides equitable access to data and benefits globally. It enhances scientific understanding and knowledge generation and provides important baselines for marine biodiversity monitoring and, and assessment. It holds data from non-commercial, non-target fishing spaces, which allows an holistic ecosystem approach to measure impacts on activities in A, B, and J. We provide training and best practice methods for data collection, management, analysis, and reporting. We are linked to several international processes, such as the CBD's EPSA, the CBD's Sustainable Ocean Initiative, FEO's Vulnerable Marine Ecosystems. We are a member of the GEO Bond. We are a core component of GEOS, uh, the system of systems of GEO. We are an affiliate of GBIF, and we provide baseline data for ocean assessments, such as the UN World Ocean Assessment, the Transboundary Water Assessment of GEF, and we are listed as a key data source by IPBES, the Intergovernmental uh, Platform for Biodiverse and Ecosystem Services. We were appreciated for our contribution to marine scientific research by the United Nations General Assembly lately at their uh, Ocean uh, Omnibus Resolution. And we support access and benefit sharing regime in BBNJ in terms of data repatriation, non-monetary value, but also indirect monetary value. If you look at the potential for economic growth in sharing data information, uh, scientific reputation, you can build up your CV through scientific papers by accessing data from OBIS. And we should also bear in mind that what would be the cost of not sharing data and information and knowledge uh, if decisions on the management of the ocean are based on the lack of knowledge, there can be, there can be huge costs involved in that. Also, what I wanted to share with you is that in, according to the IUC statutes and Article 3 and the functions of IUC, it says that IUC should respond as a competent international organization to the requirements deriving from the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea and the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development and other international instruments relevant to marine scientific research related services and capacity building. Also, in the document that which is mentioned quite a lot of times is the IUC criteria and guidelines on transforming technology, which was published by UNESCO in 2005. And there, one, in the guidelines for implementation, it says that IUC is a competent international organization for promoting and facilitating transfer of marine technology. So it's really up to IUC to coordinate the clearinghouse mechanism for transfer of marine technology providing we have the necessary resources to do so, of course. If you're interested in the, in the number of new developments, we are documenting these on GitHub. So, um, so thank you for your attention. And 
I will. Um, so unfortunately, I will. I cannot be there with you today, but I will arrive on uh, on Sunday. So I'll be there from Monday onwards. So I'll, I'll see you soon. Thank you.